inside your glory we give our lives fully to you and we cry holy holy are you and we It burns inside Our hearts are satisfied By you Your love is our reward Is why we ask for more of you And we cry home Taken by the wonder of you. Here inside your glory, we give our lives fully to you. Precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. Good to be 
Okay, well, good evening, Calvary Chapel, Temecula, you rowdy bunch. Welcome to Wednesday night service. If you're joining us online, we want to welcome you to this evening's service as well. And we're going to be making our way through the book of Nehemiah together, so it's a blessing. Why don't you guys go ahead and stand up, and we're going to pray and ask the Lord's blessing upon the service, and then Brad and the worship team are going to lead us in some worship, all right? Okay, Lord, we just want to commit this evening in our hearts and our minds and every aspect of this service this evening into your hands, Lord. We're asking for your spirit to be with us because apart from you, Lord, we can do nothing. And our worship and our study of the word and our fellowship and all these things need to be directed by your spirit, Lord. They need to be uh, encouraged by your spirit. And so we invite you here this evening, Lord, to have your way in this service and in our hearts. Uh, be with Pastor Joe as he brings the word, Lord. We're so grateful for him and all of his diligence in studying the word. And so bless us, Lord, with understanding, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we are going to start with a nice hymn. <laughs> Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King, creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy help, salvation. All ye who hear, now to His temple draw near. Praise Him in glad Praise to the Lord who o'er all things so wondrously reigneth. Shelter thee under his wings, yea, so gently sustaineth. Hast thou not seen how thy desires ever been? Granted in what he ordained. Hallelujah, 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 For thy work in defending Surely his goodness and mercy Here daily attending Ponder anew What the Almighty can do If with his love he be adore him all that hath life 
sacred breath come now with praises before him let the amen sound from his people again gladly for a adore him let the amen let the amen sound from his people again Lost or saved, find their way at the sound of your great name. All condemned, feel no shame at the sound of your great name. Every
piece of land that was slain for us. Son of God and man, you were high and lifted up. And all the world will praise your great name. Jesus, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Lord, you are so great, and we thank you for meeting us here this evening, Father, for worship in the word as we come closer to you, as we uh, look for your will and discern who you are in our life, Lord, at every given moment. Father, we ask that you would bless us as we come close to you. You are the greatest one, Lord, and we thank you for who you are. We love you. Fill us tonight. Give us understanding in your word and let your spirit fall upon all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please be seated. It's good to be with you tonight. And we are in the book of Nehemiah. Let's turn to Nehemiah chapter 4. Now, we've seen that Nehemiah was given permission by King Artaxerxes in the mid-5th century BC to go back to Jerusalem to build up the walls and to set the gates and to give them a better living condition and some protection from the enemies around them. And so Nehemiah makes this third journey back to the land and he brings with him this audacious notion that he is going to build this wall around Jerusalem and he's going to bring a better living environment for the people there. But in the meantime, we see that there was some opposition that arose between Sanballat and Tobiah against the work of God in Jerusalem. And the, um, Nehemiah prayed to the Lord. He, you know, he communicated with him and, and he asked the Lord to let it be his battle between him and those who opposed the work. And then in the rest of chapter 2, you find that there was a plan that was implemented. Nehemiah organized after his nighttime survey. He toured the wall. He saw the conditions. And then he put the plan of action in play. And we see now coming into uh, chapter 4 that this is where the opposition really arises in earnest. So the next three chapters, you're going to see six different schemes or devices that the enemy uses to oppose the work of God, to take down what God has called Nehemiah to do. And we can also learn from it because this is probably the most clear exposition of how the enemy works to hinder the work of God. And so in chapter 4, we're going to see two hindrances. And then in chapter 5, another. And then the rest of those six hindrances will be seen in chapter 6. So the next three chapters, look for how Nehemiah deals with the opposition. So notice that Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 2.11, he says, lest Satan take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices or schemes. But sometimes we are ignorant of those things. They take us by surprise. We're not looking for opposition in what God has called us to do in the Christian life. And this is an important section for all of us because we all want to fulfill what God has called all of us to do. And we want to be understanding in how the enemy goes about to hinder the Christian walk and also how we can respond to it. So notice in verse one, we see the first scheme of the devil here to oppose the work of God it says, but it so happened when Samballat, remember Samballat was the governor of Samaria, heard that we were building the wall 
that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. I mean, this furious nature that he brought uh, to the work of God there in Jerusalem, it means to burn with or to be kindled with anger. It's the very thing that drove them into their mocking and ridicule of Nehemiah and the work. And this is that first device that the enemy often uses, derision or ridicule or scorn of somebody. And that's what mocking means. It means to scorn, to scoff, you know, to make fun of, to ridicule. And this is a very powerful device that the devil often uses. And many believers take their first step in responding to the call of God, but they're only met with this wall of opposition. And then they get discouraged and ultimately they fall away from what they were originally called to do. Or it gets put on some sort of hold of some sort, and then they end up collapsing. And you can see there's different types of people within the church that often can take physical uh, abuse or physical threats. If it's material in nature, they seem to deal with that with no problem. But then when, you come, when it comes to an emotional or a mental ridicule of some kind, it seems like they just wither like the flower in a sun they just kind of fade away and they just dry up and they just disappear from God's calling on their life. And certainly, you know, this mocking can take a toll on an individual. And that's why the devil use it. It's very effective against the people of God because people want to be seen in a good light. They want to be understood correctly. They want to be, you know, have a good reputation. They don't want to be seen as lesser than everybody else. So it's just in human nature that we put up these self-defense mechanisms in order to preserve those things. And then we uh, do all we can to preserve how people see us instead of doing all we can to fulfill what God has called us to do. And so we see this first device that the enemy you know, throws up uh, at him, but of course, Nehemiah is not going to take this uh, and uh, fade away. As we know, he's going to depend upon the Lord. And now he describes for us in verse 2 the, the nature of the mocking that took place that was leveled at the Jews. It said, And he, that's Sanballat, spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? So again, this mocking and derision continues, and he does it in front of the entire army. And so he's whipping up this army with these deriding comments uh, to Nehemiah and his workers. And the first thing he says is, what are these feeble Jews doing? So he calls them feeble because they are seen with a lack of power. They're seen with a lack of effectiveness, in other words. Because remember, they've already seen two returns. They've built the temple already, but everything else is just deplorable. And so they think that everything is going to continue as it was, uh, but they will be in for a surprise. And I love this because the feeble Jews are going to build this wall in 52 days. Uh, that's just an unheard of pace, and that's in about eight weeks. They worked six days a week for eight weeks. It brought it to about 52 days, and it was just an amazing feat. But that's what God does. He uses the weak things of this world to confound the wise. He uses the powerless to make the powerful shudder. And what do they do? They give glory to God. And that's how God works. That's how he does things. You know, you can just think in your own life, perhaps, or I can think about my own life. There's no way that um, I can take any credit for what I have done in these past few decades. It's all the Lord. He took a foolish person and he helped him uh, understand to the point where I can now at least minister to people. And albeit not perfect, um, and I don't need to convince you of that, do I? Um, <laughs> But that's what God does, doesn't he? He just takes people, uses them, and God gets the more glory because of it. Just think about how he took 
the little nation of Israel. It wasn't even a nation at the time Abraham was called. I mean, that is just a powerful thing to see what God can do through a little know-nothing nation who are a bunch of nobodies to bring the scriptures to the whole world, to bring the Messiah to the world, to give a whole prophetic plan where Christ returns and set up his messianic kingdom through this one nation, Israel. So this is what God does. He gives us a job greater than our natural abilities to fulfill. I mean, think about that for a moment. He gives you a work or a calling that seems to be over your head because, number one, it makes you dependent upon him. It helps you to cry out to him for help and for grace and his mercy. But it also gives him the greater glory in the end when it finally comes about. And what a beautiful thing. And Paul describes this very thing in 1 Corinthians 1 when he writes, For you see your calling, brethren, not that many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So when the devil mocks you, it's a very powerful device. And basically he's saying, you, you're going to do what? You're going to do that? There's no possible way you're going to do that. And unfortunately, um, that's what God has been doing from the very beginning, not only with the nation of Israel. He took a little uh, last born in his family, the, the ruddy um, guy out in the field tending sheep and made him a king of Israel, the greatest king, and then gave him a dynasty that would follow through the kings of Judah all the way down and then eventually into the messianic rule, which would be Christ and then into his kingdom. Of course, this is what God does. He'll, he'll give Samson the jawbone of a donkey to use. He'll give David... The, uh, a slingshot. You know, he'll give you and I those gifts and tools we need to make a difference in whatever he's called us to do. But make no mistake about it. it the work is not about you and your status or your reputation or how lowly you are. It is one in which God will perform it through you. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And that is something Paul reiterated completely. Zechariah 4 tells us that it's not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And so Nehemiah will rely on this, but they go on ridicule him. Will they fortify themselves? The question implies a negative answer. It implies that this is something impossible for them to do. Will they offer sacrifices? Again, something impossible. They'll never be able to offer the thanksgiving sacrifices for the completion of building the walls. That's what the implication of the question is here. They'll never get to that point. Will they complete it in a day? In other words, they're saying that the Jews have no idea what kind of job they're undertaking. They have no idea what they're putting their hand to. This is going to take a long time, and they think that this is just an overnight job. They don't know what they're getting themselves into. It's a massive project. Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? And so mockingly, Sanballat says, what are you going to use, the burned bricks and stones that are lying on the ground and the burned gates? Are you going to use all those compromised materials? You know, he's making fun of the materials even that they're going to be using. They have to draw from whatever's there. And a lot of it was compromised and, and destroyed and cracked and burnt and, and so forth. And this is what the devil often does with you and me. You know, you're going to do what? You're going to do that with this? Are you kidding me? Who do you think you are? You know, I remember first when I was um, just wanting to really pour myself into the scriptures, I said, I'm, I'm going to go to Bible college. I want to learn in a systematic way. I really want to go through the Bible and learn as much as I can. And the first thing out of my family's mouth was, what are you going to do with that? Why are you going to go and go off and, 
go study the Bible. What a waste of a life. And they had no idea what God could do with anybody who had a heart that wanted to know him better. And that's the simple reason why we study. We want to know God. We want to know his word. We want to know the truth. And they just, though they couldn't see it, neither can Samballot see it, the mocking will continue uh, throughout the project. And, you know, I love what he does even in the believer's life. You know, we think it's impossible to use what the devil has burned up, what he's torched, what he's destroyed and torn down in one's life. We think there's no way this life can be put back together and the walls built around this person any, any longer. That there's, you know, it's like Humpty Dumpty. He fell off the, the ledge and there's no way they're going to put him back together. That's what some people's life seems like. But it's awesome that God can do what is humanly impossible. He can do what you and I can't do. He can restore. He can renew. He can make you whole again by the peace that Jesus Christ uh, ultimately gives us. And then he goes on in verse 3, Tobiah, Sanballat's partner, joins in the opposition. And he says, now Tobiah, the Ammonite, was beside him. Him was Sanballat. And he said, whatever they build, if even a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. So even if they do uh, build these walls with all these compromised stones and materials, even if the smallest animal goes climbs on it, it's going to come tumbling down in two seconds. That's how much confidence they had in the Jews rebuilding uh, the wall. Um, and ultimately, uh, you know, they're just uh, misunderstanding what God is using his people to do and the power that's available uh, ultimately to his people. And most people have an inaccurate assessment of what God is doing. And then when opposition surfaces uh, to that misunderstanding of what God is doing, um, God proves them wrong. He just takes it and reverses it and shows how powerful he can be through working through somebody who's available to do God's work. And I love that for all of us because that means all of us are qualified for ministry. All of us are qualified. And what God builds he has control over the destiny of what God builds. You know, let when two get married, two are joined as one. Let not man put asunder. In other words, God will be the only one that can join and to separate. He is the one that's in charge of that. The same is true for all the work that you and I do for him. I mean, just think about the work that you've already done for him. And perhaps what does it look like today? You know, how has God used it? And what can he use in the future when he gives you more work to do? Uh, you should be confident and not uh, buy into the ridicule uh, that it's a weak work or that it's not lasting. Because everything you do in the Lord will last for eternity. It doesn't matter what happens to that work here on earth. And hopefully God can use it in any way he, he needs to and how he wills to use it. But it will last for eternity in God's mind. He will remember it. And that will be a wonderful basis for some of your rewards. You'll be judged on those things. And God will reward you for it. But what does Nehemiah do to these uh, ridiculing, mocking questions? He doesn't start fighting and throwing rocks at Samballot and Tobiah. What does he do? He starts to pray. And this is what we ought to do when opposition comes. Notice, hear our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sin be blotted out from before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. In other words, what Nehemiah is doing here is actually praying an imprecatory prayer. Um, you can see those throughout the book of Psalms where David, you know, smite their jaw, break their bones on the rocks, you know, take them out, O Lord. Those are called imprecatory Psalms. And what Nehemiah is doing here is basically, number one, he says, turn their reproach on their own heads, you know, make it backfire on them and then give them as plunder to the land of captivity. Let them go away and be taken captive but Nehemiah is not being insensitive here. He's simply praying the word of God. 
Because back in Genesis chapter 3, God laid out his foreign policy. He laid out the consequences for people who curse the Jews, who oppose the Jews, and so forth. And it said, cursed those who curse my people, basically. Bless those who bless my people. That is how God approaches these things. So Nehemiah or is simply praying what has already been stated to Abraham way back in Genesis chapter 12. And then in Joshua 1.5, he is praying for victory over his enemies, that his enemies will be defeated, so to speak. And so prayer according to the word of God is always a good thing. Nehemiah prays that the ridicule would backfire and that his enemies would be judged for their attempt to oppose the work. And he spoke with God first, didn't he, here? And then he talked to men. We can't get those backwards. You know, he didn't start talking to Sanballat and Tobiah. He didn't start talking to his crew. He started praying to God, praying to the Lord. And when you get those things backwards and you start talking to people, and then after you talk to the people about the problem, then you start to pray about it. You always go back and think about your conversation and you think, how can I change that? You know, what words can I, can I make different? Maybe I shouldn't have said that. And we start to try to repair all the damage that maybe we, we, we made without going to God and letting his spirit direct us first. So what a beautiful progression of how to do things. Prayer when opposition comes. And then in verse 6, notice Nehemiah's response is equally instructive to us. When he finishes in precatory prayer, it says, So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Now, some people simply pray, but it says here, So we built the wall. He prayed, and then he put his prayer into action. A lot of people just sit and wait to see what's going to happen by the Lord after they pray. And then they don't do anything until the Red Sea is parted for them and they can walk across on dry, dry ground. I mean, how many of you have done that? Boy, I'll be the first guy to raise my hand to, to pray and just wait and see what the Lord does. And there always is a time to wait and be patient. But in this time, he was already given the commission to do the work, fulfill the work pray and work. It's faith in action. And that's what the book of Nehemiah is all about. And so prayer and hard work would be his remedy when he faced the opposition. There's a spiritual and a human element in play here. You know, let God do what he can only do. And then we should be doing what we can do. You see, we don't just want to leave it all to God. He has determined from all eternity that he would use you to accomplish his will on earth in so many areas. And so we should be praying and doing. And the entire wall was joined up to half his height. So it's telling you that he's half done with the wall. Half done. So we're probably, if chapter 6 verse 15 says it was about 52 days or 8 weeks, then we're probably about 4 weeks into its rebuilding and based on a six-day work week. And so notice for the people had a mind to work because they were unified. We can get sidetracked. We can be overly affected by what everybody else thinks or by the opposition that comes against the work. And ridicule can hurt our feelings. And certainly, you know, sticks and stones can break somebody's bones. You know, but names will never hurt me. Names do hurt sometimes. And unfortunately, um, some people allow this ridicule to have an effect on them because they believe it or receive it. And you don't have to receive that. Just like Nehemiah, go to the Lord. The battle is the Lord's. He has already put a commission before you. And that's what we need to keep our eyes on is that work of God that he has given uh, to us. We're, we, we shouldn't respond in the flesh. We don't have to preserve how people look at us because the only person that matters, how he sees us, is the Lord himself. And being obedient is a very important thing when it comes to the work of God. You see, when you're more interested and desirous to being obedient to what God has called you to do, like Nehemiah was, and less 
interested in responding in the flesh, that's when obedience will win the day. Your love to obey God is more important than your love is to satisfy the flesh. And once that, that imbalance is maintained in the positive for God, then all this other fleshly responses don't matter anymore. They just don't, they don't have a hold on your life. They don't move you to, to either sin or to rely on your own power to do something. It's your love for God outweighing your love for your own will to be done. That's when good things happen. And that's what's happening here for Nehemiah uh, as well. To please God rather than to please man. And then notice he goes on to verse 7. There's a second device the enemy uses to threaten or to oppose God's work. And that's physical violence. Notice in verse 7. Now it happened when Samballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed, that they became angry. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. So Nehemiah's rapid pace, he's half finished with his project, probably sparked the ire of those who wanted to oppose it. And notice all the people he lists, the Sanballat, that's the governor in Samaria, which was north of Israel. You have Tobiah, uh, and then you have the Arabs. The Arabs were south of Jerusalem. The Ammonites with Tobiah were east of Jerusalem. Then you have the Ashdodites were on the coast. Uh, that's a Philistine city. And that was west of Jerusalem. So basically he's saying that this anger problem and this threat to come to attack is surrounding Jerusalem. They're from the geographical areas that forms a ring around Jerusalem. And they are going to do what they can um, and try to upset the work. And, you know, it really, I think about this ire. It always, they're always getting angry. They, they have an anger problem. You know, it's like, get some anger management going on in this. But you don't see that. You see them getting more furious and more furious and more furious. And that's what you do to the devil when you obey God. You, you make the devil go reach for some digestive aids or some Tums or, you know, you just, you, you make him get so upset at God's progress through his people. And that's a wonderful thing to see happen. I mean, I'd love to see the devil get mad all day long. Of course, the consequences we have to be ready for. But when you obey the Lord and you start to follow his directives, that's what happens. Uh, opposition comes, you know, people who are upset at your work, people who want to destroy it or set you off track or get you off the rails, so to speak. Uh, that's what they want to do. And they'll use anything to do it. And so this cabal of opposition that is formed by all these people who conspired together. Notice it's a corporate plot to come to attack Jerusalem and create uh, confusion. And Nehemiah's response is also corporate, prayer. Nevertheless, we, plural, we made our prayer to our God. This is the second time he goes to the Lord in prayer. Prayer is firing the winning shot. That's tapping into God's will, discerning his will, asking for things that you need, asking for that protection and wisdom, all the way through. What a beautiful uh, tool that we have as Christians uh, to use. Pray to the God Almighty. And half the battle is simply to acknowledge that, that this is a spiritual war. You know, sometimes we, we go through our life and we don't even see the spiritual battle that rages above us, around us, behind us, just like they encircled Jerusalem. It's all around us. And it comes in from all directions and we can't materially see it and so we think, for example, that we, it's just not happening, just not there. But boy, if we were, have our eyes open for just a few seconds to see what's going on around us, we would be astounded. I think we would all be praying constantly all day long. And that's why Paul said, pray without ceasing. And that's what Nehemiah did, praying, resisting the devil, and he will flee from you, uh, the book of James says as well. And notice because... Of them, we set a watch against them 
day and night. So not only did he pray, they added action in order to take care of the problem, to defend themselves against this possible coming attack. It's wise to use security. You got to think practically and spiritually. And that's what the whole book of Nehemiah is about, right? The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the spiritual aspect of things, and then the trowel, the practical aspect. And faith in action comes together, and Nehemiah shows us how to go about that opposition. First and foremost, pray. Secondly, it's not a battle between you and somebody else. There's something behind it that is actually working woe and using people to get to you. See, the devil doesn't mind using people. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about whether you die, whether you live. He wants to get at God. He wants to hinder God. He wants to stop his work, prevent his kingdom to be set up. And so he is going to leave no stone unturned in order to bring about the woe toward you. Be prepared. You know, how many Christians say, oh, I've come to the Lord. I'm, everything is now all rosy and great. You know, so for some people, it gets even worse. You know, the devil's upset, and he's going to do everything he can to get you back into the world. Uh, he's not going to let you go that easily. And so trusting in God, absolutely. You know, it's, it's not a lack of faith to use security here with Nehemiah in case cha- God chooses to use it. But then notice as he goes on, you know, but these measures didn't solve all the problem. A new one emerged within. In verse 10, then Judah said, the strength of the laborers is failing. And there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. And we know, of course, that the enemy likes to attack at opportune moments. Think about Jesus's temptation. The devil would return to him at a more opportune time. And that was most likely in the garden, you know, to see if he could dissuade his will to go to the cross. And fortunately, the Lord battled through that, and he won the battle of the will, so to speak, to go to the cross, to die for our sins and so forth. But ultimately, that's when the devil strikes. It's when you're tired, you're hungry, maybe you're lacking the funds. He knows. He's done this for all of Uh, Since humanity was on the earth, he has studied mankind. He studied you. He knows your press points. He knows what gets you riled up, and he knows your weaknesses, and he knows your strengths. He may not be able to get you to sin in profound ways like you did before you came to the Lord, but he can certainly use natural things to get you to blow your top or to get you off track or distract you or divert your attention. And you know, through C.S. Lewis's books, you know, in the screw tape letters, as you see the master demon mentoring his, you know, little apprentice demon, that how are we going to reach these people who have already come to faith? And he describes their advice to how to get Christians to get off track. And he says, what you need to get them to do is to think about the past. Think about the past, all the problems they had in the past, everything that happened to them, get them to be reminded of those things, let them dwell on those things, and let them feel gypped and ripped off and mistreated because of what happened in the past. Or they can live the glory days of the past, whatever it might be, but keep their attention in the past. And then there's an option to keep them in the future, the attention. Get their attention going to the future. Send them to the past. Send them, you know, to the future to remember or to um, look forward to all those things that might happen. And also to be fearful about what could happen. So he gets you to divert your attention to the past. He wants you to focus on the future so much so where you can never focus on the present because that's where God's will takes place is in the present. It doesn't take place in the past in your life. It doesn't take place in the future. It hasn't arrived yet. It takes place right now. Whenever you did something in this world, you were always in the present tense. You were never in the past. You were never in the future. You were always in the present. 
And if he can rob you of that precious moment of the present tense in your life, like he's trying to do here presently with Nehemiah building the wall, then he has succeeded. He doesn't have to grab your soul through um, something else. He just needs to divert your attention and you'll miss the Christian life because it only happens in the now. And if you can be aware of that and that the devil wants to dissuade you from that, certainly you'll see that the now is the most precious moment. I love what C.S. Lewis says. He describes the tenacious approach of the devil when he writes this. It's just one sentence. The enemy will not see you vanish into God's company without an effort to reclaim you. I mean, isn't that so true? And he doesn't even have to reclaim you in a total sense. He just needs to grab your heart on a few things. He needs to change your mind about a few things. And he can have that little foot in the door. He can work huge havoc with just a few decisions that you would make uh, that would be contrary to God's word. You know, all of us experience this kind of fatigue that he's describing here. You know, we, we go to work. We might break our back to get a paycheck. You know, we come home exhausted and so forth. And Nehemiah and his workers um, were probably lifting and sifting, you know, obviously without a backhoe or any type of modern equipment to help them. I mean, they were exhausted, most likely, and the devil knows when, when to strike. And boy, this happens in Christian, Christian service. We, we take steps of faith to embark on a new work, but soon enough, you know, all the new car smell wears off. You know, the cheering dies down then you find yourself face to face with the work itself. And that's the moment at which the devil knows when to strike. You know, when all the excitement, the exuberance, it kind of wears off, then it's that commitment to drive you through. I wonder what Nehemiah was thinking when he was half done with the wall. And then he's facing all this opposition. What have I gotten myself into? You know, what, how are we going to finish this under these kind of conditions? and so forth. You know, it's that long, hard work in service to the Lord. It's normal to experience the discouragement that comes. Uh, We need to realize that the physical weariness can often translate into spiritual compromise. Uh, The devil studies us, and he chooses that time, and the battle is being aware of it, being aware of it. There's a bigger battle going on behind the scenes. Pray and yield to the Spirit of God, and that's what Nehemiah will be doing here. And in verse 11, he goes on to say, And our adversaries said, They will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. So when they were tired, their adversaries were spreading this message that there was going to be a surprise attack upon Nehemiah's work crew, that they would attack them with the sword, they would kill them, and so forth. And that would put an end to God's work. And these are serious threats. Certainly, I'm sure that that was on their minds. So in verse 12, so it was when the Jews who dwelt near them came, they told us 10 times from whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. In other words, the people who lived out and about near Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs and so forth, they would come to the city to work and they would hear on the street. The word on the street was, whatever place they turn, we're going to be all over them. And so they're hearing this gossip spreading throughout their community that there's going to be this surprise attack. And notice it wasn't a one-off rumor. It said they heard this 10 times in their community. And so what is Nehemiah going to do? He's not going to ignore it he is going to put a strategy in action to prevent this attack. Notice verse 13, Therefore I position men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings, and I set the people according to their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. So he picks out these strategic positions to position the, the fathers or the heads of the families with their weapons at openings in the wall that haven't been sealed up yet, And he places whole families there together, the women, the children, 
and the men take up their weapons and so forth. I mean, are you going to fight hard if your family's right behind you and they start attacking? Of course you are. You know, they're, they're setting themselves up for an extreme high motivation for resistance to those who begin their attack because there are people who ultimately depend upon them to be successful in that defense. And notice it says, and I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. So Nehemiah charged them to face the situation with courage. He slammed the door on fear, since likely they were thinking they surround us and we're all going to die. You know, they've probably that running through their head and so forth. And so he appeals to their courage. So they probably said, well, give us a reason for that courage. Give us a reason for why we should defend this. And what does he say? First, he says, remember the Lord. We often forget the Lord's faithfulness. And when we forget that faithfulness, our courage goes with it. Because if you're trying to defend in your own power, and your own strength, then that is doomed to failure. Because there's, or, there's always somebody bigger, stronger, faster, and more equipped. Okay? There's never, you know, you're, you're not the ultimate in defense, so to speak. None of us are. And what does he say secondly? Great and awesome. Don't underestimate God's power. Don't underestimate what he can do with a little. And certainly Jesus showed us that by feeding the 5,000, you know, a couple different times and the 4,000 and so forth. He can multiply. That's multiplied force factor, so to speak. He can do it and fight for your brother and your sons, your daughters and your wives and fight for the sake of your family. And that's what we should remember that our prayers and our reading of the word and our fellowship with the brothers and sisters is for the sake of not only your immediate family, your children, how <clears throat> when they watch you do that, they see you pr praying, they know that you're praying, they see how you live your life, you are putting up a bulwark and a defense for them without perhaps even knowing it, that you're being a good example in other words that they see the model, the pattern, and the prescription, and then they rely on that in their time of need. They come full circle around back to them. I've seen you know, prodigals over and over again kind of revert to what God has done in the parent's life, and it sometimes translates down into the life of the children. Teach him in the way he should go, and they will return to it. That's a general promise. Generally speaking, yes, they will. And that's the hope we have. I love what C.S. Lewis says in his book, The Weight of Glory. He describes that spiritual war with a military expression or illustration. Notice what he says about this. He says, to be ignorant and simple now, not to be able to meet the enemies on their own ground, would be to throw down our weapons and to betray our uneducated brethren who have under God no defense but us against the intellectual attacks of the heathen. Good philosophy must exist if for no other reason because bad philosophy needs to be answered. And so his intent was to show how we shouldn't dismiss all ways of thinking. There's good ways of thinking and bad ways of thinking. The same is true when we are in that spiritual war. When you fail to pray, when you fail to get into the word, when you fail to yield to the spirit, it's like laying down your weapons that God has given you. You're not using those tools. And when you don't use those tools, guess what? The people behind you that don't know any better, that you love greatly, they suffer for it too. And that's something we need to keep in mind. It's not all about us. It's about the people around us, the people you love. And that is what we can learn from, from Nehemiah here. And there's no doubt, fear is a powerful force. It can be a dangerous thing if it's allowed to take over our thinking and our heart. 
Uh, you remember when the spies went into the land, when Joshua, or not Joshua, but um, the spies were sent out to spy the land out, and Joshua and Caleb were part of those spies. They came back, 10 of those 12 spies ended up having a negative report because they were fearful. Look how big they are. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. Look at their, they have walled up cities up into the heavens. There's no way we're going to overcome them. And fear took over. And that was a tragic day because they were sent back out in the wilderness for another 38 years before they came back. And that whole generation died out because of a lack of faith. They appealed, uh, unfortunately, to fear. And it began to seize them. But not only is fear a powerful force, faith is also a powerful force. You see, when you have faith in God, the God who loves you, perfect love casts out fear. And that faith in that loving God is going to help you have the courage and the strength to withstand anything that God puts you in front of. And you know what? I have no doubt that people within the church can even withstand so much physical and material punishment, so to speak, when it comes to their finances and the things of life and so forth. But it's the inner things that are so very important. It's getting up off the couch when you're tired and you, want, and you need to serve your spouse. It's, you know, you know, I don't have time for that, though I know I should be doing that. I, I don't want to do that. You know, we, we make these decisions throughout the day that just seem to fly into the radar because they don't have a big footprint. We think they don't, but they actually do. And so by relying on the Lord, fear is neutralized. You see, fear neutralizes faith when you allow it to take over, and faith neutralizes fear. When you have faith in God, you're fearless. You can tackle anything. You can scale the highest mountain. You can come all the way back in life, so to speak, when you have faith in God. Because you know that the object of your faith is all powerful. He's all sovereign. He's all loving. And when you know that, you have the confidence to move forward. And that's what Nehemiah, I think, wants to instill, especially within his builders. He goes on to say, And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us. And what he's talking about here is the surprise attack was now cat was out of the bag. We know what's going to happen. And that God had brought their plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall, everyone to his work. So the element of surprise was taken away from Sanballat and Tobiah and that cabal of opposition. And they couldn't use that element anymore. So they averted a surprise attack by taking the right precautions and prayer. And then in verse 16, and because of this plot, Nehemiah instituted some changes here going forward to protect the people. So he says, so it was from that time on that half of my servants worked at construction while the other half held spears, and the shields, the bows, and wore armor. So he's saying that 50% were working construction and the other 50% were actually continuing to work as masons on the wall. And he divided his forces, so to speak. And the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. So literally, this word behind literally means supported. That they were perhaps also standing guard and assisting the guards at, at the wall and so forth. So the nobles, the leadership who weren't given a job to do, they picked up the, the sword and, and supported them. Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction and with the other held a weapon. Even one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built. So even the stone working masons that weren't carting the materials to the place where they can build the wall, uh, they had a sword on their side using both hands to build the wall so they can grab that sword in case there was an attack that ultimately came. And I don't know if you remember, but Spurgeon, he had a, like a newsletter or a ministry letter that he would publish, and it was called The Sword and the Trowel, I believe. He saw the relationship between the spiritual approach to opposition and the um, practical approach as well, faith and action, the human element and the spiritual element. 
And it was so important that we see this here because God doesn't have us to do one or the other. It's not like praying all day and then doing practically nothing. You see, we follow our prayers with action. You know, remember, faith without works is dead. In other words, put your prayer into action, ask the Lord your petitions, but then take steps in order to fulfill what God has called you to do. And he will work through whatever instance you find yourself in, and he'll bring it about. It's a mysterious process, isn't it? But we've all experienced that. And that is something that can be very encouraging uh, to the church. And so the New Testament says that we have some wonderful tools at our uh, disposal. And the first one is the Word of God. Remember, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Paul told the Ephesians. And that's important to know because it's truth. You see, truth is very important. And the second ingredient that he gives us to, to move through the Christian life and to do his work is love. You see, truth and love, because truth by itself becomes cold and hard, doesn't it? Without the love. It's a hard pill to swallow to get from the head down to the heart. But then you put the love with it, it helps it to translate from the head and people receive it, that truth. Because that truth can be something they don't want to hear. It can go down to 18 inches into the heart, right? You see, but if you just have love without the truth, what happens? <laughs> There's something else that happens. And that is, your relationship becomes mushy. It becomes ungrounded. You're just built on emotions, so to speak. You see, it's the truth that anchors the kind of love that God wants you to use as a believer and it's the love that anchors the truth that we give to other people. You see, truth in and of itself is dogmatic. It's cold. It can be very cold for some. You know, but love, mushy love, what kind of love is that? You know, that's got to be anchored in God's word as well. And the two working together form a powerful alliance to bring about God's gospel in the hearts of people. And notice what it says, and the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. So this trumpeteer would just follow Nehemiah all over the place. He'd just have his little trumpet, follow Nehemiah wherever he went, the trumpeter went. And if there was an attack, the trumpeter would just blow on that trumpet and everybody would rally to the point of the attack because they heard the trumpet. And they would have this system, like a, a built-in human alarm system uh, that he instituted as well. So very wise, very practical Nehemiah was to overcome this opposition. Then I said to the nobles, Nehemiah says, the rulers, the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive and we are separated far from one another on the wall. Whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us here and there. Our God will fight for us. So you can just imagine this huge project. They were spread out so far around that wall. There was probably workers and then troops and then workers, and then troops. They kind of probably interspersed them around, and they could get to that place of attack very quickly because of the trumpet. But I love what he says here at the end of verse 20. He tells us, our God will fight for us. So again, Nehemiah encourages the people by reminding them that the battle is the Lord's. This is important to realize. When God calls us to do a work and people rise up against that work, God takes it personally. He takes it personally. It's like somebody putting their finger in his eyeball. It's not only irritating, it's inappropriate. Okay? And God will take measures to do this. If his people are attacked, he feels attacked. That's just the way God rolls. Do you remember in Acts chapter 9, when he had to appear to Paul, then called Saul, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And this is long after Jesus rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, but Jesus appears to him and says, why are you persecuting me? You see, Jesus felt that the persecution of his church was persecution of himself, me, he says. He doesn't say, why are you persecuting these other people? He takes it personally. And certainly God will take it personally. He will act and we may not see how he opposes our enemies, but he is active in doing it. 
He's working behind the scenes, so be encouraged. God's will will always be accomplished. He'll do whatever it takes to get his work done through his people. So we labored in the work, verse 21, and half of the men held the spears from daybreak until the stars appeared. Wow, that's a long day. You know, till the sun comes up, till the sun goes down, and you see the stars in the sky. They took up arms to be vigilant, to watch the wall in case of an attack. At the same time, I also said to the people, let each man and his servant stay at night in Jerusalem. So in other words, those people who lived outside the city who came to work in the city to build the wall, he said, don't go home. It's too dangerous. Don't go home at night. Just stay here in Jerusalem. Um, just, just hunker down here, spend the night, wake up, and we'll start the work again. And certainly you can't sustain that for a long period of time. So there was motivation to continue getting that wall done, you know, quickly. And so notice verse 22 says, at the same time, I also said to the people, let each man and his servants stay at night in Jerusalem, that they may be our guard by night and a working party by day. So he's condensing, he's bringing together his forces He's consolidating to be strong and to save time, to maximize the time that God has given him. And then in verse 23, he wraps up and says, So neither I, my brethren, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me took off our clothes, except that everyone took them off for washing. So these were long, hard days. They basically are saying here that they wore their clothes even at night. They slept in their clothes. They didn't put on their pajamas. I don't know if they had pajamas back then, but you know, little furry shoes and stuff like that. You know, they, they just slept in their clothes. The only time they took them off was to, to bathe, to wash for cleanness and so forth. And ultimately, what a great lesson that is to always be ready, to always be ready. You see, the Christian life is not a part-time walk in the Lord. It, it, some, sometimes we think it's like part-time. It's Wednesdays, maybe Sundays, and whenever we're with our Christian friends. But no, you're to stay dressed and ready to serve the Lord at all times. What does Paul say in 2 Timothy 4? He says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. It's telling you all the time, be ready. And that is something that we should take heart in. And not letting your heart and your mind slip just because we're not at church. Or because we're not around Christian friends. That's when the devil can strike again, right? We have to, remember, we don't want to be ignorant as to the wiles of the devil. So let's beat him at his game by appealing to the Lord through his strength, through prayer, through the word, through taking practical steps to do what he's called us to do. It doesn't relieve us, relieve us of that responsibility to move forward in action, it's not all spiritual. It's not all physical. It is the sword and the trowel. It is both faith and practice. It is the word and the work. Okay, It's the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And it is taking practical steps for spiritual self-defense. And what a great chapter that is, Ephesians chapter 6, wearing the whole armor of God. Can't wait to get there in our studies. So what a beautiful thing that is. Let's take Nehemiah's words to heart tonight. Let's remember how he approached these things, especially not taking the opposition personal. God, why do you have it in for me? You know, why do they always pick on me? Why are they always saying this to me? By doing that, you're making it all about you. And it's not all about you. And we should be cheerful and blessed that you're suffering persecution. It sounds strange to say and even to experience, but that's how the early church felt when they were thrown in jail. Remember the apostles early on in the book of Acts, it says that they felt worthy. They felt so empowered. They felt terrific because they had the opportunity to suffer for Jesus. And that is what Paul means by the fellowship of his sufferings. Paul certainly suffered quite a bit. And he had great opposition. We read through the book of Acts, and it is just over the top. Thrown in jail multiple times, beaten multiple times, dragged out of Lystra, and thought he was dead. He was shipwrecked a couple times. 
floating in the deep of oh, a day and a night, he says. He was taken up to the third heaven where God dwells, heaven, heaven, as we know it. He couldn't express what he saw and heard there in human language, just inexpressible. In other words, he thought he had died, it was so bad. But Corinthians, when we read those two epistles, he tells them that he learned two things by going through the opposition and the persecution he went through. He learned to come to the end of himself, he said to the Corinthians. In other words, he learned not to trust in his own power. He learned not to bank on his wisdom or his knowledge of the word or anything like that, but to trust in the spirit of God. And the second thing he learned was that he could comfort others now with the comfort he received when he was in persecution. You see, he knew God's comfort firsthand by experience. And some of us, we try to give a plastic comfort to people. Wouldn't it be better to give a comfort that's sourced in experience? People can tell the difference. And that's what you and I can have. We can be quality in that comfort. We can bring to the end of our own works. We can cease from our own works and really rest in that Sabbath in Christ as he always wanted us to do. So what a beautiful book, a beautiful chapter that gives us a blueprint on how to respond to opposition. And as we go into chapter five, the whole chapter is one opposition, one device by the enemy. And then six will give us the remaining devices he uses. But today, it was ridicule, derision, and it was also the threat of physical violence against them. All right, let's all stand together. And if you need prayer, we're here to pray for you with you. If you need to work through something you're experiencing, boy, let's work it through. Let's get prayer going and, and really get you back on track, really you know, remind you of the power of God that's at your disposal. Let's, let's use all the tools he gives us in our tool belt. You know, It wouldn't make sense for us not to use that power of prayer in the word. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. We thank you for your wonderful power, your presence with us in good times and in trials. Lord, we pray that anybody who's going through opposition, Lord, that you would be there for them and that you would show yourself mighty to them. Lord, work either behind the scenes or overtly. Your decision, Lord, but we rely on you and your strength. Use us, the nothings, to confound the wise. Use those things that are not us, Lord, to confound those that are, Lord Jesus, for your kingdom. Let us be faithful to you. And Lord, let us increase in our faith and let us understand that faith triumphs over fear. Lord, we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
praying for you. Stay, hang out, and chit-chat. God bless. Your presence, Lord, expecting to meet with you. We just say that we need you so badly. We come to you for help, for life, for hope.